As critical infrastructure, factories and other vital production centres embrace an Industry 4.0, it's providing them with benefits around efficiency, maintenance and output. But while smart factories have their advantages, connecting Internet of Things devices to these networks also has the potential to leave them open to cyber attacks. This is ZDNet Security Update. I'm Danny Palmer, and with me to discuss industrial IoT and its potential security vulnerabilities is Barrett Mystery, Principal Security Strategist at Trend Micro. Thanks for joining me, Barrett. So first of all, why are so many factories installing uh, these type of devices to become smart in the first place? Well, it's all kind of driven by Industry 4.0, and this is all dynamic information back from effectively your production floor. So you can adjust and tweak your processes to be the complete optimum. And in order to do that, you need to get telemetry data back from all your smart equipment. So you know whether you've got enough material, the right manpower, the right resources, what the stock and demand is, and then kind of tune your processes according to that. So you can see the benefits of kind of merging these two environments of having your production floor and your heavy compute element where you can do some analytics and processing to gain some business uh, insight really. That's very useful for these organizations but adding these devices uh, is now adding additional security worries uh, to these networks some of which that which the organizations might not have uh, previously thought of before. Yeah absolutely I mean um, if, if you think about what's happening previously this this whole kind of production floor, which is now becoming more agile and uh, much more smarter, would have been in isolation previously. It would have been completely separated from the, the outside world. And what we're doing now is we're starting to poke holes in that kind of barrier or that isolation zone. Um, first of all, it's just uh, inside between the IT network and the OT network or your production floor. But more and more so, what we're seeing is whole as we're taking data out to the cloud to leverage cloud-based services for the analytics and, and kind of uh, data mining that's out there but more so with the um, third parties that are out there so you've got vendors like Siemens for example or Itachi or whoever it is you know they want to get remote telemetry out of the equipment on a customer's premises so they can also do things like proactive maintenance know when to send a service engineer ahead of something breaking down or replacing a part or anything like that and we're seeing these ecosystems kind of develop more and more um, and if you look at that kind of attack surface it's significantly increased over the last 10 years from something that was just isolated to something that is now not just interconnected within your own enterprise but we're interconnecting to the outside world to other third parties as well and with that interconnectivity we're also seeing the use of uh, remote apps as well so for example we've seen previously machines uh, the interface to control machines would have been just dedicated to that machine there would have been no external connectivity um, what we're seeing now is the, with the use of mobile tablets and mobile phones you can now give a production analyst uh, a tablet and they can walk around the factory floor without having to physically visit the machine itself and obviously to do that means that you're going to have to increase the capability of the device uh, you need to give it some kind of web presence for example and that opens up a whole additional attack surface which production engineers or people in OT have never thought about before. As you just mentioned the benefits of this is that it allows uh, the people who work for these organizations, the, these, these factories, these industrial systems to remotely check on uh, these systems. But I guess if, yeah, if they can do it, and if these devices are connected to the outside world, uh, it's possible for attackers and, and cyber criminals to do the same. Absolutely. And believe it or not, you might think it's hard to get into these systems, but it's not. It's possibly even easier than what would be on enterprise IT systems. If you think about on, you know, our normal user laptops and things like that, we've got a lot of controls on there now. You know, things like anti-malware protection, uh, we've got behavioral analysis machine, the whole lot. And we can patch on a frequent basis. You know, we, as a new vulnerability comes out, we can patch our endpoint. The problem you've got in OT is that as these vulnerabilities come out, you can't patch these systems, not straight away. So unless you're a complete greenfield environment where you just, you know, started everything from scratch, chances are you're going to have a mix of technology. You're going to have some legacy equipment, 
and you're going to have some what we call mid-age equipment and you're going to have some now the legacy equipment is the most exposed because that's the equipment that you can't patch or there might not be a patch available for it and so most of the attackers you know in terms of their arsenal they'll know that actually we know of attacks that were around five six years ago we can just take them and point them at these legacy systems so that's one really easy route in um secondary route is just uh, targeting users as well with things like phishing campaigns and things like that. And what you're finding is the OT domain or the factory domain is your easy route into the organization. Um, gone are the days where people thought it would be impossible because those barriers have been collapsed, I would say. And they're using that as the entry point and then traversing northwards into your enterprise IT or going horizontally across your production floor to see what else is available. Um, and I think the other big thing that has changed is the third party supply chain. Now, I mentioned about these integrators uh, wanting to do things remotely, um, but some of the equipment that they're using, you know, that whole thing has changed from being very proprietary vendor supplied equipment to being custom hardware that can be used for multiple sets of um, types of activities. So a good example is things like a Raspberry Pi. You know, you can take a Raspberry Pi and you can adapt it for a number of different things depending on what you're doing, right? But the actual libraries that are used Pi, they can come from open source and can come from other places. And you can see that's an, another attack vector for these cyber criminals come into. So the whole exposure the, or the surface of attack is significantly bigger than it was. So not only is, is the attack surface bigger, it means there's more kinds of attack, attacks which uh, criminals could conduct. I mean, you discussed the idea there of them using it as a gateway to the corporate network, but I suppose with industrial systems being connected to the internet, it also brings about the potential of attackers potentially being able to gain access to cyber physical systems, which could be very bad for all involved. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is where we're going to see this kind of next evolution of attacks occurring, highly bespoke, highly targeted. And then it comes down to the motivation of the attacker. So I would say previously, it would have been someone who had been after espionage, uh, you know, watching a, a manufacturing process and kind of understanding that and then being able to copy it. I think what you're seeing now with the modern day criminals, certainly the ones that are out for digital extortion, how can I make money very quickly? You can see some enterprising criminals uh, tapping into the manufacturing process and just making some minor tweaks in some of the products. So it could be a hole that's only two millimeters offset. And what that then means to the manufacturer is that they have to go into this whole cycle of product recall. And that can be costly, it can be expensive. Um, depending on what the uh, device being manufactured is, you know, the ongoing consequences could be quite significant. Um, worst case could be loss of life if it was something like medical equipment or anything like that. But more likely, it's going to be uh, invalid data that's going to come back. And, and so you can see a cyber criminal could quite easily say, I've infected a batch of your stock, which isn't right. I'm not going to tell you what it is unless you give me the money. And you can see schemes like that happening all the time. And the, the biggest difficulty is once that product goes out of your factory and it's shipped and into distribution, how do you do the product recall for all that? And then the reputation that goes with it. You know, there's so many knock-on effects uh, that can hang on the, off the back of that. I think this is more than what would be a ransomware attack. You know, these types of attacks are really significant. So you can see if someone wants to do a major takedown or really wants to extort a lot of cash out of someone, you could embed yourselves in a lot of these processes and say, I'm going to hold you to ransom. I'm not going to tell you what I've done until you give me the money. And it's not a simple case of just rebooting your system now, because there are other inherent processes that could be affected as well. The idea that, that these could be used for, for destructive attacks like that is, 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 is quite scary in a way, because you know ransomware is bad, but ransomware is there basically to, for extorting money. But while they're doing it uh, in potentially to extort money here, uh, in the situation you just described, we've seen also seen previous examples of attacks against uh, cyber physical systems, which are just for, for pure destruction. So you've got to hope that organisations which are moving forward with Industry 4.0 are thinking about this sort of thing going forward uh, as they do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, there, there are some best practices out there. Um, you know, from recent surveys we've done, um, you can see when we've questioned people that work in the OT domain about security, it's always thought of as a bolt on the very last piece of the equation. And this is where it falls over. And it, and it partly comes down to the priorities. So if you think about in the production world, your primary priority is safety, it's safety, then availability, and then it's kind of integrity and confidentiality. Whereas in the IT space, it's the other way around. It's very much about, I would say, confidentiality, integrity, and then availability. So it's getting the, that mix in the first place. Um, I think getting your security team involved into that OT discussion is also very key. Um, kind of coming up with uh, really a, a mix of getting the model right between people and the technology. People go for the technology bit first. So yeah, I would say, you know, think about having a layered architecture, putting some defenses in there. So, you know, you're not reliant on a single control, but multiple layers to get through. But then on top of that, you really need to do think about your people in the process. So you need to have some kind of risk, risk management framework. And it's so critical for your third parties because you want to establish some kind of baseline posture for your third parties because they're the people, you know, you might get yourself right, but the people that are remotely connecting in, that is the biggest kind of weakness in that spot. Um, and also from a people process person of view, you want to make sure your processes are right so that when people are doing things, for example, doing an update to a platform, they don't just randomly get a USB stick from somewhere and plug it into the system. They use a vetted key, something that's been tested and trusted. Um, they don't just allow people to connect their laptops into the production network you know, for third parties. They should have a landing zone where they're vetted and then trusted and come through. It, it, it's when you take those kind of safeguards, do you then start to mitigate some of the risk? I don't think there'll be a 100% bulletproof solution. Uh, so the only thing you can realistically do is to assess the risk and come up with a mitigation plan to reduce the risk as much as possible. And that's something that needs to be revisited constantly. Thanks, Barrett. That's some really good advice. And there's also an article on this subject on ZDNet right now, which uh, you, you can take a look at. And for, for more information about uh, cybersecurity, cyber attacks, and keeping your network, be it an industrial network, a corporate network, or your own home secure, be sure to keep watching ZDNet Security Update and subscribe to ZDNet. Thanks for watching. Thank you.